So in terms of social opportunities, you can also, what's important to know is that um, A, advocate to join existing groups and clubs. It's really important that society and the community get to know what autistic people are like, what people with all manner of developmental and associated challenges are like. You know, um, they need it so they can stop being bigots. They need it so they can stop being ignorant. Uh, they need it so they can reflect on what real social diversity is. They need it so they can get sometimes out of the melodrama of, of the things that they create because their life is not diverse enough or colourful enough to have the privilege of meeting uh, a really, you know, true social diversity in all its wonderful colours, such as that you meet on the autism spectrum. And I have said that people on the autism spectrum have a really important job, and that job is in um, highlighting and challenging uh, ignorance and bigotry uh, simply by their very existence. And so that's my kind of policy. I definitely think um, keep uh, advocating for inclusion. Now, a lot of adults on the autism spectrum uh, spend a lot of time in the head and uh, so may have a great enjoyment of their own world. They may be quite naturally solitary in a variety of ways. Solitary because they are unnerved by uh, people knowing too much about them or uh, being too personal or becoming too intimate or emotional with them. They might be these inside, they may be quite a normal person, but other people are initiating with them and they'll go into avoidance and uh, they'll keep initiating with them and they'll say and do a whole lot of things they don't mean to, to do. And people will keep initiating with them and, th and they'll, they'll uh, retaliate or use the no when they mean yes and the yes when they mean no and then they feel utterly disorganized and feel uh, unconnected to what's coming out, uh, they to all these self-protection responses that are coming out. And people like that will end up preferring to spend a lot of time on their own because the involuntary self-sabotage of interaction and communication is so hard to continually fight and to try to calm down these chronic self-protection responses just to get some degree of control over your behaviour and communication um, and that's exposure anxiety. You may have developed very different uh, identities that then developed separately and some people with autism have done that where they're a separate person at school to who they are at home or they're a separate person when they're at work to who they are uh, at home and it's more than it's more than the usual uh, variation. Uh, they actually have created almost um, two separate people, a uh, kind of identity and compartmentalising that goes on in one environment uh, that is a completely different set to what comes out consistently in another environment. And so people who have that often will spend a lot of time on their own because that's where they experience cohesion of some degree or where the lack of cohesion doesn't jar them, doesn't make them feel weird, all that sort of stuff. So that's some of the range of things that uh, can contribute to people uh, avoiding or finding social opportunities really challenging. If a person is quite solitary and doesn't cope well with, you know, with intimacy and fuss and gush and lots of attention, then you provide for them uh, opportunities where, for example, they might be out walking uh, so that uh, everybody's in their own space. There's nobody looking at them. The focus is on the activity. It's on the doing, um, not on getting to know and get entangled with their world. Um, and that sort of thing also works with exposure anxiety. So people who have constant involuntary avoidance, diversion, retaliation responses, when they feel watched, people waiting, people wanting, um, and it, it, it triggers them into self-protection states, take them into a social opportunity that takes all the heat off and puts none of that focus on them and provides an ability to be in company in parallel with others. Um, and often they can manage those avoidance, diversion, retaliation responses. So that's pretty good.
um, something uh, like a movie club where you are going to watch a screen and you happen to be in a joint activity but there's not this face-to-face -face kind of thing um, or not much of it. Um, so there's also uh, when you look at um, the situation for communication uh, you may need to make opportunities where the emphasis is not on verbal speech or where the emphasis is not on having to have good interactive speech or where the emphasis is not on having to have uh, ongoing receptive language processing uh, so there's not a lot the person has to keep up with and so that can help uh, people with the language processing issue a talking stick around a, a table or in a group can allow people to process each person's communication without the cacophony and tumbling of everybody else's noise. Uh, helping people to bring along headphones or earplugs if they have intermittent processing and they're having uh, sensory, uh, sensory fluctuations that are making them very uncomfortable. Accepting that people involved in a social opportunity may need to take space breaks um, and showing them where they can go and take that space break, not, oh, you're having behaviours, you should go and spend some time out. It's like, hey, do it. You know, they arrive, you show them where the quiet space is, show them where the toilets are, they get involved in the activity, but they know um, that they can go and take some time out and, and you treat it as completely casual. It's not a catastrophe. It's not a behaviour problem. It's how people self-manage. It's part of self-advocacy. And um, so don't be the police about it, but just let them know it's perfectly normal. If you're struggling with the noise, feel free to go for a walk out there or uh, feel free to go and sit in that quiet space and come back when you're ready. I think that some of it is you've got to get your house in order in order to be ready to have healthy uh, social interaction. But it's equally the case that by having healthy social interaction, you get your house in order. <laughs> so it works from both sides. So the, the environment they're going into also can get on with their own activity, not be highly distracted by a person having really challenging stuff. Equally, negotiate price. If this costs something to be involved in this group and you're going along for, say, 15 minutes, they might say, no, you're paying by the hour. And you might have to accept that your 15 minutes for it to be quality, uh, you'll have more quality doing it at 15 minutes than staying for the hour and seeing, you know, the shit hit the fan. So maybe it is worth paying by the hour. But uh, equally... If you can negotiate a fee that is based on um, coming for that first 15 minutes, say for the first four weeks, and then you might find that the person is built up to being able to be there for 30 minutes, and then you pay accordingly. So a percentage of the of the fee for that involvement. But you know, it's about liaison. Skype provides a lot of opportunities now. It's free, and just go to Skype.com and allows people to make um, a, a to do video interaction with people, pretty much like what you're watching, except you have a Skype address that you swap with each other. So it's a bit like emailing, except you're doing video chat stuff with them. And what's good about um, about Skype as well, and there's a whole lot of newer uh, technologies like with several people. Um, through Skype. Well, I have Skype tea parties. I have um, Skype dinners. I have brought uh, a Skype pal out to um, join in in a barbecue. And what's good is it connects people who are in remote areas. And that's uh, really important in giving them that social inclusion and those social opportunities. And if they have a lot of self-management problems, the great thing is they can't throw a plate at you <laughs> from from the you know from their screen you just not going to hit you so um and if they've got you know tapping ticks or various things that are going to be invasive it's not going to bother you because you know you're on the other side of the screen so um there are social opportunities for all human beings on the autism spectrum
person has a communication disorder? Um, is there access to type communication there? Um, do they accept and uh, respect that this is a non-verbal person who uses alternative communication? Are they going into an activity that is based on having verbal speech? Is, is that activity accessible if you use, uh, say, uh, type communication? Or if you don't have that, um, is this activity accessible to people who are just going to be doing rather than speaking or typing? And if they're not able to be doing the doing, if they're a person who's more a people watcher or they have very high exposure anxiety, so they can't access an activity instantly, they need to take time to map it all out, to wait until the heat's off and nobody's jumping in and controlling them and then they might start to test the water with the activity. So this is exactly how I love to learn. I prefer to watch somebody, observe from a distance and then I need time to process it, think about it, make a new file in my brain about this topic, maybe read something about it and have some time before I jump in and try it myself. That feels the least stressful. When I am pushed to do it right away and then another person watches me while I'm trying my first time, I absolutely can't stand that and it makes me irritable and annoyed and distracted. I really can't stand that. So if I can choose it, I prefer to observe and then try myself sometime later. Jolting when people tried to connect directly and it significantly overwhelming to have people uh, directly interacting with me. Um, the, lo the more that uh, they interact with me, the longer their strings of blah, the more meaning deaf I would become as I progressively fell behind in the ability to try to keep up with speech. So there were very um, good reasons. Uh, also, things like emotional overstimulation um, and not being able to control those self-protection self responses when I felt emotionally overstimulated by the intensity, by the directly confrontational nature, by the perceived social invasiveness of other people's interaction. This activity um, allow for people to do some people watching, do some fly on the wall stuff, to just absorb the patterns, um, take in the voices and movements, if say they're face blind, before they're expected to interact with what to them keeps feeling uh, like very unfamiliar people and, um, and may continue to do so. Lighting, rather than the harsh white lighting, um, work better. Lampshades rather than overhead lights. Um, uh, you might want to uh, make available the possibility that the person has um, sunglasses indoors or has their own um, so that they can cut down on the amount of incoming visual information and gives their brain more time to process what's left and then their stress level should come down as well. But there are other things. Um, in, in my house, I have to, I take time to have to map the patterns of how to use a room. So if I come into a new space, I'll commonly want to reorganize it like the last place that I was in so that my body, because my body tends to be my eyes, if you like, um, and the way my body maps a room is what brings out the thought processes that help me connect everything. So if you change it physically on me, if usually, you know, the kettle and the tea and the cups are on this side of the room and I go into another house and instead they're in the middle and over here are 
Tupperware and over there and something else, I might not be able to uh, function as I would at home. And you might think, oh, well, hang on a minute. Um, uh, what doesn't she just look and understand and do? But just like with maths, if I throw really challenging maths at somebody who had, has dyscalculia, um, in other words, a significant problem processing mathematics, their brain will kind of freeze up and they can work through it very ploddingly and slowly with a lot of tools and help, but it's not just straightforward. And the same happens for me, I guess, in visual processing. Um, and so I need my space to be in a logical sequence and all the things that are in there belong to that concept. Uh, I guess the other thing is um, sound. And uh, if, if we're talking about autism-friendly environments. Um, I have difficulty processing language when there's other noises around, so fans or, uh, you know, outside noises or chatter in the other rooms and stuff like that. But you can set up furniture and floor coverings and um, you can uh, double glaze windows, for example, or use curtains to close sound out, to control sound. You can put curtains across doorways and archways, for example, that help contain sound. Um, you can insulate ceilings that will change the acoustics in a room and sort of gather sound more immediately for you in a sense. There's less um, reverb in the room. Um, when we're talking autism-friendly uh, environments as well, um, escape spaces, so uh, to ways of, of, of going and being in your own space, um, of having space breaks away from language, away from the sound of TV, away from uh, the sound of computers, um, away from the sound of, you know, screaming kids or whatever, just um, places, little sanctuaries. And you can make these out in the garden. You can make little sensory spaces out in the garden. You can make them on a back porch. Um, you can make them, uh, you know, in a small, a small room, even a closet, uh, you know, in the far reaches of, of your home. You, um, if you have a very small place, you can even make it underneath the table with a tablecloth, something that allows somebody to go and just get into a quiet space, a sanctuary um, that doesn't feel like it's subject to the same level of not just social invasion but the sensory invasion um, when it comes to outdoors and gardens a lot of people um, with autism love to you know walk on walk on rock walls or walk on rails a bit like the cat um, i was a rail walker and a rock wall walker love it love it love it gravel piles love it um, walking on sand hills love it sand pits love it Bark pipes, love it. Um, uh, being among uh, trees and their different textures and the foliage, um, being able to roll in grass, um, having a hill to roll down. Uh, these were all things that I, I think, um, I interacted a lot with textures. So I love fish ponds. So having a fish pond uh, where someone with autism can go and. Uh, sit quietly and just hang out with a living creature that's moving and being. Um, uh, places that um, collect the little mini beasts, you know, that attract mini beasts, so gardens that attract mini beasts, gardens that attract butterflies. Uh, all those things can be really uh, um, grounding, I guess, for a person with autism, but even providing them with a sense of communing with something, a sense of being social and connected in the world. So just because you might feel you're failing in the people world or the communication world or, um, doesn't mean that you're failing in the world in general. So those things can be really therapeutic. An art space. I'm an artist um, and I think that there's a lot of autists who have autism. And just um, having that ability to create art with nature, you know, to get a stick and draw in the sand, to um, uh, have a big piece of perspex that you can 
um, you know, paint on with water or with mud for that matter. Um, uh, ways of using the outdoors as an art studio um, to make temporary texture-based um, uh, experiments, uh, I think, can be also quite autism friendly. So and so with exposure anxiety, you learn very early that the ways to manage it is avoidance, if people keep pushing, diversions, if people keep pushing, retaliation responses. One of the problems is that um, you, you develop this mentality, this identity, that you are a person protecting yourself from the external world. So you begin to identify as a person who has to protect their own world at any cost and that the intrusions of other people are the problem. Um, the fact is that if you have autism, you might have difficulty thinking about the needs of the other person that when you're caught up in an action you're just thinking about what you like you're working on an animal level in a sense um, or you might be the kind of person who actually feels so socially invaded that you really don't care that you're putting other people off because that feels good to get some distance um, uh, you don't want them to approve of you because you wouldn't want them to sidle up to you and become joined at the hip and you know become even more invasive uh, than what you already perceive them to be you know in your auto reality have a significant communication disorder and you're already feeling quite a world apart in which case caring about how you're upsetting other people you're already upset and it's the world that feels it feels to you like the world has upset you so from the other side now, of course, I look at that and I say that is absolutely no justification for revolting behaviour. Um, so, so you get this them and us mentality. And once you um, get older and you start to see why you want to pursue interaction, you start to see why you want to pursue communication, you start to see why you want to have a body and develop self-help skills, the problem is that by then you've spent several years with avoidance, diversion, retaliation responses so that they're now like a hair trigger. Um, and you, you might find that it's not just the initiations of others that now put you into this, but it's your own desires and initiations that that self-protective part takes as a sellout, finds as a threat and then throws you into avoidance, diversion and retaliation responses against your own initiations. That becomes a threat and the only way to um, undo that threat and to placate that raging uh, self-protection force is to smash the thing that you've just created. And so this is an extremely frustrating uh, condition for somebody to be managing because they know uh, they may ultimately know that they care about you, that they want contact with you, that they want to learn things, that they want a place in the world. And they can't work out why their body isn't listening, why their emotions go over the top, why they end up feeling like they've sabotaged and they've failed in the very things they wanted to do. So that's why exposure anxiety is called the invisible cage because you... Um, it, you know, you're giving out these mixed messages and you're trying to get through the bars at the same time you're identifying with the bars. You know it's a prison at the same time you treat it as your sanctuary. You want to escape that world at the same time you defend it with everything you have. Uh, it is that battle to join the world and the simultaneous battle to keep that world out. So some of the ways around this is how do we calm the nervous system? Well, first of all, you really need to address the sensory perceptual problems so that they are so reduced that there isn't that much to self-protect to self about. If you've got someone who's disoriented, who isn't getting the level of nutrition to their brain, who's dealing with high toxicity, um, deal with the gut immune metabolic issues so that they are better able to handle um, sensory perceptual input so that information coming in is cohesive so they're able to keep up better so there's less to automatically defend through avoidance diversion retaliation responses if you um, uh, if you find that you are emotionally overstimulating this person um, and that that together with overwhelming them sensorily 
is heightening that self-protection response, you can reduce that in a whole lot of ways. One of the most uh, easy things to do is instead of being opposite them, which is quite sensorily bombarding and in, in, in the animal world quite uh, potentially threatening on a physical level, if you are, if your nervous system is um, this hair trigger, uh, you know, uh, heightened uh, reactive state, you go off to the side. Instead of interacting with them directly, which can, which in their state can be taken as socially invasive, no matter how much they want it um, interpersonally, instead of interacting with them directly, if you interact through the object, the object and the issue instead of the person, the heat comes off and they can relax. Watch how many autistic people interact with each other. They do so in parallel via an object. Um, uh, if, when, when they do tend to bombard each other directly, one will tend to start tuning out the other and becoming indirectly confrontational. So take that as your language. Adapt to your behaviour. Um, keep things small doses. If you always push the interaction to the point that the person um, went into avoidance, diversion, retaliation, you reinforce the lesson that the world will always overdose them. The world will always force feed them with interaction. You want to turn that around. You want to so uh, leave them with the constant experience that they had been left wanting more, that that sets up a competition with their identification with their self-protection mechanisms. How could that stuff be protecting them when the world was not overwhelmed? How could that stuff be protecting them when they had been left to do the chasing, when they had been left wanting more? So play hard to get, keep things small doses, always leave them wanting, work in parallel, address the object and issue of the person. Keep things third person, keep them relatively formal, keep them low key. If you're going to praise, don't get in their face with, God, boy, yay, look at what you did, because we're not all that type of personality. Our nervous systems aren't all designed that way. And there are a number of people with autism who became significantly more autistic after the big first or second birthday. So maybe the way to praise is instead of putting it on them directly, is being off to the side, looking at the object and saying, I wish I could do something that good, and then walk off. Walk off to allow them that processing space to feel non-invaded as they digest their own feelings about someone having said something about what effectively is a bridge between their will and your will. And bridges can be threatening. If you believe that other people are the invaders, that they always overwhelm, that they always give you more than you can handle, then bridges are quite challenging. You want to treat those bridges with respect. Another way with exposure anxiety that you can reduce it is um, by using characterizations, by using voices, by using puppets, by using costumes. Um, as long as it's not you, there's nobody being exposed. Um, uh, attributing the responsibility to the object. It's not you they're asking. It's the toilet roll that needs to go to the bathroom. And then once you've gone to the bathroom, then you're able to use it. It's not you who's being asked to get in the car. It's the keys that, it's the keys that want to go to the car. And you just happen to be the person on it. Anyway, you can find more information in the book Exposure Anxiety, the Invisible Cage, which is on my website, DonnaWilliams.com. <laughs>